We talk to the legends of the creative and entertainment industries. We talk to those on the rise. Lance Dean Anthony Nielsen asks about the highs, the lows, and everything in between. This is Outcast Creative, and this is Industry Interviews. Hello, uh, thanks very much for uh, joining me on this uh, rather gorgeous and somewhat uh, uh, rainy uh, Wednesday evening. Now, I've got an excellent guest uh, lined up uh, today, uh, but before I um, get into that, I do want to um, c cover something else. Um, unfortunately, as as happens, um, I lost. Uh, you know, we, we 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 if you know a lot of people in this industry, which um, uh, for better or worse, I do. Uh, um, unfortunately, we're we're all going to lose friends from time to time, and we lost one today. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, the actor um, Ewan McIntosh, who many people will know as Big Keith from The Office, but his career did go far beyond that. Uh, he did a number of roles in a number of other independent films we had talked about doing a project together uh, sadly he passed away today at the age of 50 i'm sure he'd approve me um putting this particularly interesting picture of him um up on smoking guns uh, uh um from a it's a it's a indie film uh do check out his other work uh, apart from uh his role as big keith on the office of course um uh those scenes as well can be found on youtube uh he leaves behind a, a pretty interesting uh, legacy of work uh, was a very talented guy. He was a really caring guy as well. Quite quite an intelligent uh, and thoughtful um, individual. You could have a proper laugh with him um, down the pub. Pub. He wasn't quite as quiet as his character of uh, Big Keith. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'm going to miss him. And uh, you know, it's, again, we we actually met um, at the theatre. We'd both been to see a play. Ended up sitting pretty near each other. Um, Ewan was quite a big chap and he was moaning about the uncomfortableness of the seats and uh, we kind of uh, bonded in the interval in the bar and then we met again um, during a rather car crash interview of uh, Chevy Chase um, and uh, yeah, added, added each other on social media and the friendship kind of went from there so uh, yeah, just wanted to give him a shout out today I might do a, I might do a special episode about him and his work uh, and his performances at a later date uh, but Okay, so moving on tonight. So I've got, like I said, really special guest uh, today. Now, when I was a, a wee ban uh, growing up in um, South London, Kingston upon Thames, uh, my go-to comic or source of uh, creativity, apart from films, was 2000 AD, which was, uh, uh, I guess, The Eagle was the first British science fiction comic but that was way before my time and it was a little bit old hat it was a little bit sort of upper class rather stiff characters one might say uh, and then 2000 AD came along it was kind of brash it was loud it was rude it was rock and roll it introduced us to the characters of Judge Dredd, Rogue Trooper, Strontium Dog, Robo Hunter, ABC Warriors, VC I mean uh, the list goes on um, and this man who's coming on tonight oversaw what I would call its golden era, which is kind of, uh, you know, the the um, uh, progs from sort of uh, the late 70s through to issue 500. And I read it from issue one until into the 400s, give or take. So my guest uh, tonight, uh, Steve McManus, um, who's a comic book editor, uh, writer, uh, and has presided over other things as well. Uh, oversaw that era so he's going to be a fantastic guest but first of all my co-host and fellow 2000 AD uh, fan uh, the real Tomby because the fake one wasn't available here he is <laughs> good, good evening season. good evening how are you doing not too bad it's not too bad obviously good. you know a little bit of a sad day yep. but, yeah yeah rest um, in peace you and yes it was it's, it's, a, it's a shame shame to hear it so I, I feel for you my friend I feel for yeah you. well um as he would say, the show must go on. Go on. Um, so that, that's what we're going to do. Um, so without any uh, further ado, apart from when did you read 2000 AD from? 
Um, so, so for me, I only started with ni- uh, around 1986, 1987. Oh, that's um, much was... later. Yeah. That's kind I of think... interesting because you're going to cover a period that I yeah. don't know anything about. But it's also going to be a period that Steve doesn't know anything about because I don't think he was the editor then. But we'll find out. I picked out. it up from my dad because my dad had been collecting them when he was in the armed forces. So, so I did found you read all the these... older issues yeah. as well? Yeah, oh, I started great. with the older stuff because great my stuff. dad had them all tucked away. He was collecting them when he was in the armed forces, and that was the first thing I, I found as a kid. I was like, "Thank God for fad dads." I know. Tell me about it. Amazing. So, well, without any further ado, here's the man uh, himself, uh, all the way from Tharg headquarters in London. It's uh, Steve McManus. Thanks for taking uh, time out of your evening and joining us, sir. You're welcome. You're welcome, guys. Good to see I'm, you. I'm not sure 90 minutes is going to be enough time to cover everything we want to get into, <laughs> but we'll 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 do our best. Um, now, pre- I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I do with all, all my guests. I'm just going to ask you a load of quick fire questions. There's no right or wrong answer. Just give me the first uh, thing that comes into your head. Can you remember the very first film that you saw on the big screen? How the West Was Won. Good choice. Uh, what was the last film you saw at the cinema? Uh, the other day, Bob Marley, One Love. Uh, oh, was it good? Did you w- decent film? I thought it was, but I've since been told uh, the play was much better. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, when you were uh, editor at 2000 AD, um, who was the one British um, comic book artist that you really wanted to get? under your tenure and have them do a strip for you? Uh, it wasn't a question of me getting anyone. They would, they were either already there or um, would send in their work and we would say as a team, yeah, you, you, you're on board. So we didn't have to headhunt people. They came to us or they were there already. Could, could you give us a name of someone who they sent their work in and unanimously the team went, wow, we've got to have this person? Uh, well, Colin McNeil, um, Alan Davis of Marvel fame. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole host of names. But um, at the same time, we mustn't forget that uh, writers, yeah. creators like Pat Mills, would um, have their own people sending them uh, samples. And they would, Pat would then suggest to the team on, on the editorial that this artist would be a good choice to join the join the company as it were as a company of actors sure and, yeah well, well we'll 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 come back to that that kind of decision making process in, in 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 a bit what was the uh one comic that you were reading um outside of 2000 ad sort of during that era was there anything you were buying you were purchasing be it marvel dc yeah, I, I, I was reading uh, in house, so Battle Picture Weekly, which I'd worked on before, because um, I, I have a, an affection for war comics. As any young schoolboy growing up in the fifties would, that's all we had really was war and sport. So I always kept uh, an eye on Battle, and in that great comic, John Wagner was writing uh, Charlie um, Darkest Mob. Pat Mills was writing uh, Charlie's War. So there was some very good writing going on in that title under the editorship, I may say, of David Hunt. Um, who is your favourite 2000 AD character? Uh, Scrunchium Dog. Ah, uh, do you know what? That's that's good because that's also mine. Everybody always says Judge Dredd, but Scrunchium Dog's actually my favourite also. So that makes a change to hear someone has yeah. got the same same pick because that's that's pretty rare what would you uh say is a film that you personally watch once a year uh doesn't necessarily have to be the big film uh, best film of all time it could be a guilty pleasure but one that you'll probably always watch once a year (laughs) um uh, once a year well depending on the season at christmas it will be uh home alone one uh, in the summer, it will be um, D-Day, the longest day, uh, 6th of June. Uh, in spring, maybe something more romantic, I don't know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I vary. I, I, I go with the wind. 
You've got you've got quite a wide uh, taste there. And last of the quick fire questions. Um, in the last sort of, I don't want to go too far back. Let's say kind of in the last fifteen years, fifteen to twenty years. So after the year two thousand, what's one television be uh, television series, be it British or American, that you saw that you went, oh yeah, this is benchmark. This is really good. Well, either The Wire or The Sopranos. Yeah, The Wire is 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 quite a common answer to that question. Yeah. The Shield is 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 my personal favourite of those. Our friends in the North would be the British one, although that was late nineties. Um, yeah, great stuff. So you 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 started out. Um, I think you you joined. Is it IPC magazines? Kind of was it around nineteen seventy three, something like that? Yeah, at the age of um, 20. 20. Blimey. So, I got a um, job. Yeah, I got a job on a comic called Valiant, which was one of the big sellers of the time, anthology, um, 100,000 copies a week. Tiger was another one. Um, it was it was good times for artists and writers and, uh, and for, for the readers too. It was all good stuff. I mean, look at that, Valiant and TV21, three pence. Yeah. That's, that pop. was the first thing that draw, draw me into the uh, title there, the three P. Yeah. I mean, this was this was a good eight years before I was even born. And can you imagine getting something of quality for three pence these days? I, I remember going to car boot sales and you would you would often find like stacks of Valiant at a car boot sale. And I'm pretty sure that I grabbed this one because I remember it had a Star Trek ship and dinosaurs on it. And anything to do with dinosaurs or Star Trek, I would I would buy. Um, so Valiant was kind of, is it, for, for those people who are not familiar with it, is it fair to sort of say it was a kind of a boy's own action adventure comic, essentially? Yes, with about uh, eight, eight stories in each 32-page issue. Each um, strip being three pages, so three eighths of 24. Then you add a front and back cover, that's 26. Inside, 27. Inside, back, 28. Four pages of ads, yeah. Absolutely, you're bang on. And, I mean, okay, so when you first joined, what was your, what was the actual first job title you held and what did it entail? <laughs> okay, so um, each comic of that time had a, an in-house staff of four. So there'd be the editor and the art editor, and then the art editor would have an assistant who had the unfortunate name of being the Bodger, come back to that maybe, and then the editor had a, a sub-editor, um, which was what my first job was. And that was to really um, read all the letters from readers and pick some to put in the next issue and they would get a prize of three pounds. Um, beyond that, there was a lot of subbing of artwork that came in, checking that the artists had drawn what the scriptwriter had written uh, and all sorts of other stuff too. So, I mean, um, I'm guessing that kind of going through readers' letters wasn't, wasn't, you know, was a job that a lot of people probably didn't want to do. Well, I enjoyed it because um, these were, you know, proto fans. They weren't fans because that word didn't exist really in that sense. And they were uh, hoping to win the three pound postal order. This was big money in those days. So they would, yeah, each letter would, um, and there were jokes too and, and, and cartoons. Uh, they were trying very hard to um, make an impression. Um, and uh, it would come in by the sackful. I've got to tell you, you know, massive sackful. I would take them home because each letter also had to have the voting coupon with it. And the voting coupon was where the reader, that reader, said which were his three or her favorite stories. And from that, we had a chart that we could say who was doing well and, and which story maybe had to be sort of wrapped up. I mean, 
so how influential was that chart? I guess that was a the form of the only form of survey that you really had at the time that got you a direct pulse on your readership. So if something wasn't getting many votes, but but you were hearing chatter that people liked it, I don't know where, maybe via just friends or comic book conventions or whatever there would have been back then. Would there ever be a dichotomy there over sort of what to cut and what to keep? Not, not really. The, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the popularity chart was king. It ruled everything, uh, despite chatter or someone saying at the water cooler, that's a great story. You know, I like it, don't kill it. <laughs> um, right. Uh, but by the same token, to be fair, um, it was obvious that uh, Captain Hurricane in Valiant was always going to be top. Ride of the Rovers was always going to be top and Tiger, yep. and mm. vice versa. So um, it was more down to the stories that were trying to get a grip on the reader's attention that uh, focus was uh, played. Uh, okay, so th so you 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 were on Valiant for how long? About eighteen months. And then from there, is it right that you went on to was it action or battle? I know they got combined. Sure, um, I went on to battle um, to join the editor David Hunt, who was picked to be the launch editor. And in a small office down the corridor were two writers who were creating the stories for David to farm out to artists. And their, their names were John Wagner and Pat Mills. So uh, right. it was a, a very interesting time. I, was, I, I didn't know the difference, to be fair. I just was pleased to get onto a, a war comic because that was my passion, I guess. Um, but at the same time, after a while, to answer your question, uh, Pat Mills said to me, oh, I've got another comic coming out. This is what Pat did. He launched comics. Uh, he said it's called Action. And would you like to be Action Man? <laughs> I said, what does that mean? He says, well, you're going to be a stunt man. And the readers will write it and tell you to do stunts. So I was kind of like freelancing for Action at the same time as being a staff member on bat battle. Right. Okay. Um, and these were all, I mean, all of these comics were owned by IPC. Yeah. Uh, uh, under the umbrella, um, it, it, the actual company was called Fleetway. Right. Which is the name of the river that runs under Fleet Street, hence the name. But um, eventually all these companies were, brought together under the name of IPC, International Publishing Corporation. And we were all moved across the Thames to uh, the South Bank and put in a 30-storey skyscraper. Drew Gordon said, only the middle-class kids would fill out the poll and send a letter with a stamp. Working-class kids would buy sweets instead. Probably, <laughs> pro pro probably not wrong there, mate. I remember this issue of Battle. Uh, I can only find a small image of it, annoyingly. And I remember owning these stickers. Um, and I would have been extremely young when, when this came out. Um, but I remember that these stickers were in my house for absolutely ages on this, this sheet because I couldn't decide what to do with them. And I didn't yeah. want to take them off. Was there any kind of copyright issue? Did you have to go to the army to say, hey, is it okay if we reproduce stickers of the emblems of various battalions, um, uh, brigades or, uh, you know, div divisional insignia, which, whichever they may have been? Uh, did, was there any conversation with them about that? Or did you just say, this will be a cool promo and just create it? Well, that, that, that's a good question. Fortunately, um, IBC had a free gift department so it was their job to um, tell you what gift you would have on your comic. You had no choice. Right. Uh, so they must have had to either ask permission or not. Um, um, but it got a bit kind of like stressful when they would keep offering you 
the same gift that another comic had had. But in the case of Battle, I must say the gifts were superb, uh, especially the gifts with uh, issue three, the trading cards. Uh, there they are, yeah. Look at that. It's the, like I read your mind. and uh, yeah, yeah. Here, yeah. Here they there are. are. Yeah, there, 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 there are people out there now still hunting for the, the one. Still hunting for the set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, there's a guy called Paul Trimble. I don't know if you know that name. He runs the Battle Facebook uh, website. Uh, and uh, he, he just the other day, I think, got his last card after 50 years of searching. So is that, is, is it, how many are there in the full set of this? Oh gosh, um, quite I a lot. Say, yeah, maybe. Um, oh god, I don't know. We, we'd have to ask Paul, but check him out. Paul Trimble, T R I M B L E. Great guy. Um, very good uh, interviewer as well. He runs a uh, his own comic convention in uh, Enniskillen each year. Right. Uh, I'll have to try and get over to that at, at some yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did have some issues of battle. I had some issues of action. I, I never bought it every week because pennies were lean in, in our house. But the the one mm. comic I did buy every week was 2018. But we'll 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 come on to that in um in a little bit. I, I mean, one of the things that I kind of picked up on even as a as a kid was. You know, when one of your comics had, had had its day, and I think the first time I remember this happening was with there was a comic called Whoopi that I used to get. Um, <laughs> and I don't think that was published by the same guys as you. Was it? A yeah, different... it was. Oh, it was, yeah, it you was. guys. Yeah. Because um, you, you had that wonderful artist who created those things called Worldwide Weirdies. Yeah. Um... Uh, the uh, name escapes me, but he's yeah. I've got here. the I've got the coffee table book of them next door. I should have got it out. Yeah. And then there was another comic called Topper, and I think Whoopi and Topper got combined at one point. And and who who's ever logo was bigger on the comic? You knew the little logo. You knew that was kind of an R.I.P. situation, and <laughs> that comic was uh, going to be it was absorbed. Uh, the best characters were kept, and uh, pretty soon after that. Uh, we would be um, we would be disappearing. <laughs> so um, yeah, I do remember when that happened. So I bought the issue one of Star Lord, and um, I remember quite clearly Star Lord was a much bigger size, and it had really good quality paper um, yes. yeah. as well. Mm. Um, and and um, maybe that's a good segue to the to the next topic is there anything else you want to say about your time on on battle before we sort of get to 2000 ad well um from battle i went to star lord um that was the brainchild of uh, kelvin gosnell who actually uh, worked with pat mills on creating um 2000 ad yeah. um and kelvin's idea for star lord was it would be more of a, a monthly magazine with great paper as you say to facilitate fab artwork in color yep um in the style of the european uh, comic magazines that were around um and uh, as you can you can see from the front covers of star lord it was uh, in the right direction but in the end of the day the management decided to fold it into 2000 ad so um, that was the end of Star Lord. R.I.P. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I really liked Star Lord when it came out. It, it was the comic that introduced us to um, Strontium, Strontium Dog. Dog. Yeah, and um, and I remember oh, that yeah. the quality of the artwork and everything yeah. was great. I had this badge, man. I had. I remember this. <laughs> I remember this badge. This badge kind of got really worn um you know worn out i remember uh this issue as well um that came with the the stickers um yeah. this one with the space calculator not really sure how much calculating i i did on that if any um but yeah i mean 
these these I think it ran for about twenty four issues before it got absorbed into. Is that about right? Twenty three, I think. Um, they those original comics must be worth a few bob, because um, they must be extremely rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, you're, yeah. you're right; they did have a really different feel. The artwork was yeah much more leaning towards the French yeah. graphic novel style. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, or sort of paperback book covers of the time, you know, full colour, painted. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and happy days. So <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm massively sorry, jealous. Go sorry, just jump into there, uh, oh. Lance. I'm massively jealous because most of these things all, all started and um, started the ball rolling before I was even born. So I missed out on all the stickers, all the cards and things like that. So it, was, it wasn't until much later, obviously, picking up some of the um, comics. Like what, they were 10, 15 years old at the time. So a lot of a lot of the uh, kind of like the collectibles were were gone at that stage. And as soon as you say in things like uh, the cards, the stickers, and the badges and things like that, I'm thinking this is amazing stuff. I, I just wish I was about at the time. Yeah, it, it was uh, the main reason to. Uh, if I can take you back to 1960, saying mm. your comic, whichever one it was, said next week a great free gift. You have to go and get that issue because you, it would be it was so valuable. Uh, given that the sense there was nothing else to entertain you in that world, you no know, color it's, TV, nothing. It's the original fear of missing out, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. You had to. All your mates would be. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. It was good times. Well, I I remember that like my parents would only let me commit to one comic a week, and my neighbour had a regular subscription to 2000 AD. By the time Star Lord came out, so I decided to get Star Lord, which I think yeah. was slightly more expensive, but just looked a bit cooler, and mm -hmm. and plus I really liked Strontium Dog. So I got Star Starlog. He got 2000 AD, and we used to get them the same day, and we <laughs> meet up and do a read through, you know, of each each other's comics. Um, my good neighbour Martin, who's who's I, I inherited many of his issues of um, 2000 AD uh, down the road. So what? Okay, so this ran for 23 issues. So was it weekly? 23 weeks? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, in terms of, I guess, it, I guess this was all dictated by sales. It wasn't selling X number of whatever the requirement of copies was. So at some point, you're presumably pulled into a meeting and listen, guys, we're going to merge with 2000 AD. Just talk us through how that happened. And yeah, well, I was sitting in the Star Lord office as the sub editor, <laughs> and in walks this guy from management who says, uh, Well, that's it, guys. Um, this is your last issue. Um, the king, his words were, The king is dead, and only the king, uh, which I suppose meant we were merging into 2000 AD. And mm. then he turned on his heel and walked out. That, uh, that seems like a rather unceremonious way to... It's a bit brutal. It, it was the way it was. Uh, I, I, it wasn't like you were then on the scrap heap. No. Were, it, it, the idea was you would then be transferred to another comic. Um, sure. Uh, I, so I mean, I that, guess in that industry you'd kind of seen that happened already you know you'd yeah. seen valiant you yeah. know and absorb yeah. a comic or two and yeah not long after this of course 2000 ad absorbed t tornado exactly yeah so uh there was a safety net there it was kind of like oh well you know better luck next time um pat mills calls it this hatch match and dispatch where you create a comic you match it to another one and then you kill it um, from the sense of the uh, publishing finance guys saying, well, we just got to be, be, we're here to make money, not entertain people. <laughs> <Alas> <laughs> <and that. laughs> so, 
that, where have we heard uh, that from where have we heard that before yeah, yeah exactly and how yeah. well is that doing yeah exactly <laughs> so but back then it, it wasn't the end of the world so um okay so you came on 2018 i hope i've got this right because it's different depending on which source sources you read but around issue 77 is that correct yeah right because yeah for those people reading wikipedia is wrong it says 88 it is. is incorrect it is so just go to show that wikipedia is not always uh, uh, uh correct so by this time i was reading 2018 um every week i want to show you a couple of covers and this is the this is slightly before your time but this is the first story that i was really invested in um and um in fact the uh well it was one day when i was around martin's house and i was a big fan of the new dan dare i i liked all the like the story with the biogs and all of that kind of thing never really never really liked the stuff with the mekon i i just sort of thought he looked stupid with his big head and everything but then they did this strip called legion of the lost worlds and i opened up the comic and that was the wow. site that greeted me and i thought this looks cool and um was very star wars it was very kind of there's this big empire and it's ruled by these evil guys and They've conquered all these other worlds and they have these ships that are basically just made up of loads of guns. Um, and it was just full of action and big. It felt very cinematic, you know, out of these amazing kind of space combat scenes. And I know this is I think uh, I don't know if this is mentioned on the documentary, but there's some great info about it. Uh, I've got some of the original issues of that. Yeah. Not all of them. One of the original issues I have currently in my shed as i said surrounded by spiders is this one um which is a fantastic cover and um i, I and, and at the time there was all this talk of this dan dare tv series being made um which you'll know about of course and there was even a a, a double page spread for it i think in in one issue and an actor yeah. had been cast in the role and i thought we were going to get this story as a TV show, and I was so psyched. I thought, this is going to be amazing. You know, it's going to be all this action, and it's going to be like Star Wars, but kind of more violent, and, you know, I was really up for it. Um, you have to tell us how old you were at the time. Oh, God, I, I don't know. Probably like um, eight or something, younger. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, it, exactly. So it was exciting to you to... And in fact, to me, uh, as a 20 year old, it was the idea of a Dan Dare TV show was very exciting. So um, it just shows our, our shared interest in, yep. in, in, in that kind of stuff, yeah? A absolutely. Um, maybe just uh, so we don't jump topics too much, much, just for the benefit of the people watching, tell us why that TV show didn't happen and what happened there. Well, it was. Um, funded by a guy called Lou Grade, who was a TV mogul in this country, um, as I'm sure many people know, um, and uh, uh, an artist named Brendan McCarthy and his fellow artist, Brett Ewings, were uh, asked to kind of do the storyboards and input um, ideas. Uh, but when Lou Grade, uh, his uh, business kind of lost money, uh, the whole show wrapped up. But as you say, there was a two page feature in 2000 about this coming TV show with storyboards and stuff. It was very exciting, but it, it, it went down like the Titanic. Yeah, it was, um, uh, yeah, it was, was a real shame, but hey. Mm -hmm. I work in the industry now and I've been on projects that have looked like they're getting the green light and gone down the toilet more than once. So I, now I know the realities of all of that stuff. This, this is the first issue I think that you were editor on. Uh, they, they, they would have commissioned that kind of a, a few weeks before I joined. So sure. Cause remember everything was six weeks in advance. So Okay. Oh, that's probably why on Wikipedia it probably issues lists it. Yeah. As, yeah. A bit yeah. later, but but bit later. Fair, fair enough. So, I mean, 
talk to us through how it works. Your your um, editor of two thousand AD on a on a sort of weekly basis. How does your how does your week unfold? How does it work? Talk us through okay. it. Sure, it's quite simple. You're coming on a Monday, okay? And by the Friday of that week, you have had to have assembled 32 pages of comic strip, the whole issue, to send to the repro house, who would then make the film to send to the printer. So the same thing. So obviously, no one can do that in a week. So you have about seven or eight issues going in different stages, yeah? So it becomes mm. a production line. And in that sense, you are more of a production editor than creative. Your job is just to get this conveyor belt, keep it going. At the same time, you have to feed the conveyor belt. So therefore, you do have to find new material uh, that's not being proposed to you. And that would come from all sorts of uh, uh, sources. An agent would bring in an artist, a writer would, might suggest, as they often did, a new story. And putting those two together, you could feed the conveyor belt. Uh, some people call it a, a sausage factory, but that, that, uh, that's not fair because we're talking about creative stuff here. We're not yeah. talking about the same old sausage. Yeah. And we're talking about responding as we spoke earlier to the readers uh, feedback you know trying to be interactive to take into the, the, their point of view and also you know time passes a year can pass and suddenly your 10 year old is now 11 so are you trying to speak to him or the new 10 year old or keep both it's a juggling act and uh, all the time around you in the world of entertainment, there's video games suddenly appearing. Uh, the whole thing is, it's <laughs> yeah, it, it was quite a journey. How would how would you look after kind of like the um, the timeline of uh, where each particular weekly episode was? Would you have, say, a wall which you'd have certain markers of this this comic is in this certain position, this one's behind, this one's ahead. Where could we save time? Where we could be. How, can you just let me know how that kind of process was working? We had a book. We called it the Makeup Book. It's about A4 size. And each spread would be an issue. So the further you turn to the right, there'd be less information <laughs> because uh, um, you hadn't filled in who the writer was, what the story was. But you had at the top of it the issue date and when it was due. So if the issue date was 20th of February, uh, it would be due to the printer six weeks before, kind of like the 12th of January, say. Yep. So those were your, your markers. And it was uh, as simple as that thinning that, that, that each issue um, on a running basis. Does, does that explain it tommy yeah yeah um and and probably a, a secondary question to that obviously you're receiving letters and and things like that from fans who, or uh, what we were called fans um coming in from the public to to kind of like get some of those ideas to feed the um the the production um how were you finding time to do the day job as well as read all of these the this uh, essentially all this mail was this all done in your own time, off your own back, to think, do you know what, it needs to happen? Okay, so the sub-editor's job was to read the mail, write the letters page, um, sub all the artwork. The editor's job was therefore solely to do with feeding the, uh, the conveyor belt. So the editor mm -hmm. would be yeah. finding new stories to put on the conveyor belt that would come down to the sub that would go to the art team and then go through to print. Gotcha. I, I used to uh, write into the letters page, but I never wanted to cut out the coupon on the comic because oh. I didn't want to chop part of the comic out. Um, so I can't remember how, how I got around that, whether I just sent in a little list of... Uh, but uh, I don't think any of my letters ever got published. I'm pretty sure I'd re remember well, that. Well, Th that's why. 
that's why you know they cut out the coupon sorry <laughs> yeah we were, we were brutal go play the game like, yeah well, well you you'd we, have to be his is like photocopies either <laughs> here's a here's a here's a question um so with a comic um strip or story rather let's say like the block war which ultimately leads into the apocalypse war which is a massive yeah. massive story i think the block war itself covered 20 Nine. issues maybe roughly was it uh not mania was nine was it, was it maybe nine or, okay and yeah you have the apocalypse 20 yeah yeah so maybe about 30 issues altogether yeah what's that whole story arc planned out from the very beginning because the twist with you know the agent from the eastern block poisoning the water and all i did not see that coming and i thought wow this is just fantastic storytelling and the next thing you knew we were into a nuclear war and of course this was at the height of the cold war when you guys were were um doing all this and that i was so invested in that story was that all planned out right did the writer behind that sit down and say i've got this great idea for dread it's going to start with this and it's going to end up with this tell us about that yeah no i i was the same as you i was the reader i would get the script each week and go oh christ i never saw that coming so the writer was uh, John Wagner and Alan Grant, perhaps as well. And um, they just wrote it and sent it in. There was no kind of like big scenario uh, meeting where he said, I'm going to do this. Uh, it wasn't like that, really. Um, why would you have to say to Pat Mills, John Wagner, Jerry Finn, and Jay, tell me about your story arc? You were too busy trying to get the comic out. So sure. Um, I was a reader like you. It was very it was nice as well. <laughs> I suppose what, what what I was getting at was in your sort of managerial position effectively as, as editor, where sometimes you've got to you, you know, your job is what are the thirty two pages every week, I guess. What yeah. is it? What is it? So if you if you know Robo Hunter's next story is going to be eight issues, and you put that up on the calendar, and that's that's going to be you know four pages for eight progs or whatever, and um, uh, Grant and Wagner say to you, well, I'm not quite sure how long this story is, but it, it, it's definitely going to be twenty, maybe longer. Surely that helps you kind of fit the jigsaw of what's what roughly what the timeline is for the next few weeks. Is is that not how it worked, or was it literally no? This story is going for another week, by the way, and maybe a couple more we'll see. And was that all you got? No, you're right. The first time it was obvious that they would say this is a long one, Steve. You know, stand okay. by for twenty episodes. And as the editor, you'd say thank God for that because I've got that slot. You know, I've got Carlos Escara. You can rely on him, R. I. T. Yeah. to deliver those six pages each week for the next 20 weeks. Same with Ian Gibson, R.I.P. He can deliver Robo Hunter uh, for that period of time. So therefore, you, as the editor, had the time to focus on the other side of the, the other three stories in the comic. Because by then, it was five stories, not eight, because they were longer stories. Uh, and you could put your effort and time into making sure those stories kind of help hopefully reach the same level or were, were a counterpart to Dread and Strunken Dog. For example, I give you a Meltdown Man um, by Alan Hebden, which was a, a very different story, but um, the readers, it really appealed to the younger readers. Right. Because it was a it really did. It wasn't quite so hard in your face as dread or strong. Uh, and so that that kept that side of the audience, the, the new the new joiners coming on board. And I remember a dad saying to me, he came to the office and he said, "My son's favourite story is Meltdown Man." And I said, "I know why, because he's young. He doesn't want dread's gun in his face yet. He will when he's ten or eleven. You know." <laughs> um. Meltdown Man, very Snake Plissken, it feels, in 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 this one. I, I I mean, I've got visions in my head of the 2000 AD gang going down to the 
cinema or the video store and having kind of you know sci-fi movie and pizza nights and then everybody's sitting around with a few beers going you know what we could do a strip a bit like rollerball or we could do a strip that's a bit uh, there must have been conversations like that oh well yeah obviously uh <laughs> there were but not on my part to be fair i wasn't a great science fiction fan so i wouldn't have known um say that meltdown man was um, a vague copy or something um if that's what you're saying um it's the first time i've really thought about it today actually just, just looking <laughs> yeah. at that image i'm thinking that looks like kurt russell from from escape from new york you know oh uh, well okay yeah well well yeah well there's all sorts of that going on in that period isn't there uh, uh, influences and stuff yeah i mean often the hero the writer would say well in the script he looks like this yeah so yeah. In, in battle um we had a story called uh bullet i think about a guy on a motorbike it was obviously steve mcqueen <laughs> yeah why wouldn't you tell the artist there's your guy steve mcqueen and the artist goes thank god i don't have to figure this out well i think also yeah. there's nothing wrong with leaning into the culture because the imagination of the readers is 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 fueled by james bond star wars whatever big movie is on at the time those are the stories they're creating for themselves extensions of those films in their head and you're you're for me 2000 AD as a comic took that one step further for me plus gave me original ideas of its of its own um yeah if you think before 2000 AD was uh, action, yeah? The one in the middle, there's battle, action, 2000 AD. Each of these three are out of the head of Pat Mills, and to some degree, John Wagner in uh, 2000 AD, and Kelvin Gosnell. But in action, uh, you can see that Dredger, uh, that the hard bitten cop is out of somewhere. Hellman is, um, uh, out of that movie you know you can see all the movie heroes so yeah dirty harry i think you had a sort uh, of yeah exactly. you had a dirt and then there was um wasn't there something called department si6 which was just a blatant yes. ci5 because the professionals yes. was a big show at the time yeah yeah there you have it yeah so it this... was easy it made it easy and i think it helped the reader kind of subconsciously connect with the strip yep because sure because they'd seen that kind of face on tv or the cinema so they saw it on this very badly printed newsprint comic and they thought oh yeah that that's a, a way in for me at least i know the face now tell me the story it's the foot in the door it's the foot in the yeah. door for the reader they see yeah. these people out there in the real world they see things going on it instantly mm. hooks them into the comic yeah. sure. it's a no-brainer it's a no-brainer. I think during your tenure, this is definitely one of your most iconic covers. And for me, what one of the most iconic stories, this is a sequel to an earlier story that introduced us to the character of Judge Death. But I loved this story because it introduced us to his buddies, Fire, Mortis and Fear. There's a great line in this, I'll never forget it, where because Judge fears the gates open up in his helmet. It's all full of all these eyes swirling around. And when he does that, he kind of either turns people to stone or just sends their brain to mush. And and, uh, and he does that to Dread and goes, he goes, gaze into the face of fear. And Dread goes, gaze into the fist of Dread and puts it through his helmet, comes out the other side. Yeah, there you go. Someone's just put it in the chat. Uh, just, there's just sort of iconic lines like that. They're so filmic. They're so... You know, I'd I'd love to see that scene in the TV series if it ever happens, on one day. Did you did you know when they came up with? And I know I know how Judge Death was was conceived because Dread was kind of almost like he was almost it was almost impervious to to being destroyed at this point. So he needed a an adversary that was going to going to be his match, which is how Dread uh, Judge Death was conceived. But did you did you realise how iconic this character was going to be when when you first saw it? Okay, so first of all, we need to credit the artist Brown. Yeah, Bonin, absolutely. Who drew all those? I wish I'd bought a page back then. Do you imagine? Can you imagine how much a page of that is worth now? 
Yeah. Uh, a fortune. Is that Carlos who who did did? Yeah. No, Brian. Brian Bolland. Brian Bolland. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that and the story is obviously the the creation of uh, John Wagner and uh, his writing partner. I do believe at this stage, Alan Grant, R.I.P. Um, so again, in this, I was just like the, receiving the scripts. Uh, I knew it wasn't a long one, so we'd send the script to Brown, and uh, then I'd have to ring Brown up quite a lot to say <laughs> when are we going to get the artwork. That was quite funny. Right. Um, but it was so, there was a, um, um, a story began to gather around his artwork and people, fellow artists, Mike McMahon, would come into the office specifically to see the artwork before, because we couldn't print it until we had all 24 pages. So sure. they'd come in to see the, this and they would absolutely be dumbstruck. And it's funny to think this artwork was just on a shelf in an office on the 23rd story of the building. And yet it went on to become, to make so much money and such an impression on people. It's odd, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do have this issue um, uh, again in the shed. I hope it's still in one piece and spiders haven't eaten it and things. But um, I, I just... This story, uh, um, this the apocalypse war, um, really stuck in my memory, and um, I think another thing that that 2000 AD did, like with films as kids at the time, is you, you'd recreate the stories in your bedroom. So we'd be recreating the battles of Judge Dredd with whatever figures we could get our hands on. Usually, some sort of Lego you know sort of abortive creation of mega city one with figures running around on space bikes and what have you no, really yeah um you'd build well, it if you didn't have it you would build it with whatever you had you know i, I i've lost well, count tell, of tell, tell us more come on it's time for you to tell <laughs> us a bit. well i think uh, to just one of the things we used to do was we, we would create our own um because at the Who's time we? dungeons and dragons was very popular but there wasn't yeah, yeah. um a Judge Dredd role-playing game. There wasn't a Strontium Dog role-playing yeah. game. So we created a... I remember I wrote a set of rules for a role-playing game called Bounty Hunter. I, I wrote them all in these exercise books that I owned. Yeah. And we drew, yeah. drew pictures of all the weapons based on the weapons from the comics and wow. came wow. up with all the character wow. traits you could... Um, wow. Uh, when you say when you say we, you and who else? There was a group of about sort of eight of us that were all oh, 2000 AD fans. We'd kind of played D&D wow. but got a bit bored with yeah. castles and dragons and princesses and we wanted a sci-fi game. And the only one out in the market at that time was, a, uh, yeah, don't worry, mate, they are in plastic well-sealed boxes so they're, and they're <laughs> in plastic covers as well, so they're, they're pretty well protected. Um yeah, but we uh, there. What the, Traveller was the only role playing game, sci fi role playing game at the time. Um, the the other stuff that's there's an abundance of stuff now. But you either had D and D or you had Traveller, um, and we wanted to play the characters from your comic. So we wrote our own set of. Wow. I wrote the bounty hunter rules. Somebody else wrote some Judge Dread. Or you know, sort of you could become a judge rules and yeah. you play games set in mega city one and i would dungeon master all the strontium dog games but we called it bounty hunter we didn't we didn't call it strontium dog um but that there was a strip in strontium dog i don't know if you remember it um and i do love strontium dog the strip was called the killing yeah and it was when and i, th I just thought this was a great premise for a movie the top 100 bounty hunters of the universe assemble in an area on the planet of Geddes or something, and yeah. they, they're all killing each other for the uh, ultimate prize of a billion Zeddies or something. And um, <laughs> Strontium Dog and Wolf are just there to collect all the bounty on all the other bounty hunters because between them all, they're worth an absolute fortune. And maybe Zeddies are only accepted in the Mickey Mouse gift shop or something. I don't know. So 
and I remember that strip really well. And I said to everyone, we're going to do this once a year as a game and you're all going to fight each other. And, and, and we called it the zone. And I probably still have the maps for that, that we, it was a different, it was on a different planet every year. And we probably did that for about five years running. So it just goes to show how you're, and I'm sure I'm not the only person with these kinds of stories, how your story, your comic and your, you know, the culture you kind of infested okay. us with for want of a better phrase. Well, well, yeah, I, I, our creativity, you know. You have to stop saying your. It's not mine. It was for people who wrote. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about the collective you, you as the editor, the ship you were piloting, well, and, yeah, well, yeah, and the people the, well, on that ship yeah. with you. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, and and please do keep naming them when I bring up various I do, strips because I, I, I know you're yeah. keen to yeah. to credit people. It's just if I do it, we'll we'll, you know, we'll be here the whole <laughs> night. But you jump in with the names. Um, I, I You've got to remember, this is me as a kid talking. Half the time, I didn't even read who the <laughs> artists were. I just wanted to know the next thing that was going to happen in the in the story. Well, um, I will say I that Carlos is my favourite artist, though. Of, of, yeah, of all right. right. So I think you should dig out those rules and um, take them to the people who own 2018 to see if you can get a game going, a licence. Uh, re uh, rebellion, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I mean, that's, uh, I don't know whether, I don't know. Yeah. They're, they're quite complicated people to deal with. Um, Are they? <laughs> yeah, sadly. sadly uh, okay. Carlos, by the way, was on my friends list on Facebook. Okay. And I did have a really long chat with him and I, I told him these stories yeah. and his art, his art work was, um, was key. Just got a, a super chat here, by the way, thanks for that. And lots of new people in my chat really appreciate you coming on and, Listening to this, um, do uh, subscribe. Steel Leg of History. What a name. I'll be trying to get my own copies ju of Judge Dredd. Be blessed, everyone. So proud of you all. Oh, well. I think that's to you and all of your team. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, it's described oh, as the, the golden era, era of 2000 AD, and I think with really good good, good reason. Um, before um, we talk about Strontium Dog a little bit more, do you... Um, is there a, a particular story? I know Strontium Dog's your favourite character, so maybe let's leave that for the moment. Outside of Strontium Dog, which story would you look back on and say, God, yeah, that one, I I really liked it? It has to be uh, by Jerry Finley Day, writer and artist, Carlos Oscara. It's, the, it's called The Fiends of the Eastern Trunk. Oh, yeah, I've got it right here. Vampires, World War Two. What did I do with it? Yeah, it's um um because that's kind of fusing horror and World War Two, which we hadn't really seen before. Yeah. Into a story. Um, I wrote a movie script based on that, which if it had got made, you would have you would have sued me for. Quite Not rightly. Me, but rebellion. <laughs> Not yeah, me. well, Rebellion would now. It was called, it was called Le Legion of the Damned, and it was the first movie script I ever wrote. Um, let me just get... And uh, I mean, is that because uh, I'm guessing that's partly to do with the fact that it combined your interest yeah. in World War II? Yes. Yeah, you got it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a, yeah, exactly. It, it's got some um, amazing sequences in it um i remember there's one bit where ru the russian paratroopers dropped during a snowstorm which they would actually do they would they, they were that crazy a and the romanians turn into these bats and they attack them when they're uh, when they're floating down and uh the germans find them the following day and it looks like all their parachutes have, have been faulty and but the main guy's saying that's not right how did how do you have this many faulty parachutes yeah. uh, and um th then he notices they've all got all their throats have been cut yeah. and ripped yeah. open <laughs> uh and then they turn into wolves in another sequence and the guy puts the skis up as a, a as a ski sticks up as a cross scars the commander and and then the next day that guy's the lieutenant's got like a scar on his <laughs> face which um 
yeah, uh, I do remember that. I remember all the different. I liked all the, the the way they could be all these different things. We'd never really seen that in a in a horror movie. I mean, that's a movie just begging to be made, man. Do, do yeah. you know? Just quickly with the with one question is how do you make a leap to bring both World War and vampires together? Just crazy. So it wasn't me. Brilliant. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was uh, Jerry. Fitzgerald, Jerry, the writer. Yeah, it was Jerry, wasn't it? He brought the script. It's just the whole point. They bring the oven ready to quote bloody hell Boris Johnson. Not quite, but an idea. And you say yes, and you say Carlos might like this, or he may say I've already spoken to Carlos. You know, it doesn't matter. We're a team, and away you go. Um, but anything Jerry brought, we would print, of course. Uh, the same with Pat or John, but those three, we they, they had an open door to the comic, uh, and Alan and Grant too. So that helped us a lot to get the comic out each week. We didn't have to faff around interviewing, reading scripts. Oh God, you know. Much as I would have liked to, there wasn't the time. Yeah. Remember, I said earlier, every seven days, bang, thirty-two pages. Thirty-two pages. That, for eight and a half years and on top of that do an annual 90 128 page annual oh yeah. we want a summer special too that would be 48 pages oh judge dread's going well we want a judge dread annual well, that's another you know and then oh this comet's going so well we want best of 2000 AD. you better get on that as well <laughs> was it was it easy to scale up the teams to meet the demand we didn't we we, we were always four in the office Always full. There was no scaling up. That's right. Amazing pressure. Amazing pressure. This is the sort of later compendium. I've got the original issues. Oh. Oh, wow. um, but the one thing that was really exciting that I didn't realise they had done is they'd done this sort of this extra story called The Red Menace. Um, in fact, there was a couple of extra stories, both with very different artwork from the original uh, this is a much more kind of modern style of artist. Um, and I should credit them. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let, let me do that. Let me uh, That's stop always my credit. eight-year-old self who, who didn't read that stuff. Yeah, but, always, um, always credit the team. Yeah, yeah the script, st it's a Stalingrad Fiends of the Eastern Front, script by David Bishop, art uh, Colin McNeil, um, lettering oh, nice. by Colin and Ellie DeVille. Um, oh, those are famous names. Indeed. The, but the original artwork was, of course, by Carlos, who was yes. my favourite artist. So I loved this story. I was a big World War II guy, and I was like, it's a World War II horror thing. I just thought it was great. Um, yeah. I remember when I wrote the script, I didn't have the comics. I'd lost them. Uh -huh. So when I wrote the script for Legion of the Damned, I just remembered that concept, and I thought, well, I'm going to do something like that. And um, there was a whole load of stuff in it that was nothing like um yeah. that was in the comic um it still would have been way too close to the bone though but the one scene that was in it was they melted down all that stuff to make all those silver bullets for the spandau machine gun and um i remember there's that shot where they all appear and suddenly the guy's got the gun over the and the other one lies down and and, and they open fire on all the vampires with all these silver bullets out of out of a spandau machine gun i thought what wow. That's such a cool... That would be so cool in a movie to see that. That must um, have blown your mind as an eight-year-old or ten-year-old. I was, yeah. well, probably was a bit older then because th that oh, came yeah. out... I was probably about yeah. ten when 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 yeah. that came Still out. Still blown your mind. It blew my oh, mind. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, talk about fueling the imagination. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting to... Interesting but unsurprising with your interest in World War II that that was your, your favourite strip in there. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So, um, uh, a question from the chat. Did I miss that one, Tom's? Okay. Uh, just one from Rick, uh, just above. Uh, and I think it specifically mentions artwork later on, but it was a case of uh, work surrounding, um, obviously, w whilst you're going about doing doing the day job and doing your editing, um, did you ever have uh, any work that you passed across to the next part of the chain 
only to have it rejected and do it do it a completely different way. From Rick Cleary. Good question. Um, well, there were, I wouldn't say total rejection. Um, uh, so this is about artwork, not the scripts. Right. And my answer. Um, there, um, there was a, a very good road behind the story about um, a musical. Uh, it was a, a, a Maggie Thatcher was in it as a droid. Yeah. I re yeah, I vaguely remember it. Vaguely. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the artist Ian Gibson, R.I.P. For God's sake, why well, I'm so sorry to keep saying this. He died mm. the other day. He drew her beautifully, but um, you have to remember that I was the editor and uh, I had people above me who were perhaps conservative voters or even IPC was a conservative led, you know, they all wanted their MBEs, they wanted their knighthoods and stuff. And, <laughs> and so if I remember rightly, her nose was really like uh, the artist Ralph, he drew very long noses. Yeah, you know, I remember her nose. The cartoonist, the, name that. The, the cartoonist Ralph. Um, anyway, so I, in my stupidity, and I'm happy to say this, I asked Ian to shorten the nose. So that was a bit of censorship uh, right. from my part, which may answer Rick's question. Yep. Um, I think um, uh, the late... Um, uh, Ian Gibson, I think it, he did the original artwork for Halo Jones. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, because there's a wonderful painting that he's done of her. I'll just put it up quickly. Sadly, passed away in December of 2023. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you had a stable of brilliance, really, when you look back at the, you know, Wagner, Equizera, uh, Ian Gibson. These are incredible talents um uh working under you during your tenure i mean this is why i think this is why people say it's the golden era but it's not just the artwork great artwork is all well and good it's the stories um i would always turn to my you must have heard this but i i would always turn to my favorite story first wherever it was in the comic oh i've got to read that next you know, part of Robo Hunter and who killed the guy at the mansion and <laughs> yeah. the robot butler looks a bit suspect. <laughs> that was like a Hercule Poirot <laughs> story. Oh, Do you like remember that? that one? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, um, Lawrence, I have to, you know, again, correct you. You can't keep saying me working under me. We were a team. Yeah, um, okay. Well, working during your time, your tenure. Well, well, Okay. And it's, I, uh, no, I have I, to correct you. It's Lance, not Lawrence, but yeah, Lawrence, go on. Lance, Lance, okay. Uh, Lawrence, Lance. Um, I had the budget, okay. Uh, nothing could go into 2008 without me signing a check. That sure. sounds a bit pompous, but just to stake my claim to uh, part my role in the team, apart from having to get the, make it all happen. But, um, uh, the rest of it was uh, a great, uh, I'm searching for the word here, it's a great word, it come to me, but it all happened to once, it was a great thing, all the great writers and artists came together as if God had put them together. Yeah. Uh, and there's, it's serendipity, there's the word, serendipity. I, I, I guess what yeah. I'm trying to say is, is yeah. during the period of which you were editor, you had all the right cogs in the machine. You had the yes. best writers, you had the yes. best artists, um, you know, and they had the best guy making sure they didn't run into any icebergs, which would That's, be you. Exactly. Thank you. Because, yeah, I have to, you know, obviously stake my, my part here. And um, I think someone else, uh, another person editing it, could have gone into the iceberg. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, um, Stainless Steel Rat was a great story, and again, my favourite artist, Carlos, um, and one of my favourite actors, clearly James Coburn, taking the role in the comic strip, which was often commented on at school. Everybody was like, that's the bloke from The Great Escape. Um, well, what, this is based on a pretty famous book, 
series of books, in fact, and, and a number of the stories I think were adapted, two or three of them. Stanley Steel Rap rules the world when he rigs and wins the election and um, so on. Who, 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 was it like one of the artists was pals with the writer or whose idea was it to, to adapt an existing novel into one of your regular strips? And what was the kind of rights issues and payments that involved in that kind of stuff? I'm so glad you asked me that um, because uh, this goes back to Kelvin Gosnell, Kelvin Gosnell, G-O-S-N-E-L-L, -L, who was the guy who wrote the memo saying we need to launch a comic because there's this film coming out called Star Wars. So we're going back way, without yeah. that memo, there would be no 2000 AD, okay? Um, so Kelvin was widely read and uh, he, uh, the stainless steel rat is by Harry Harrison. Um, and uh, Kelvin got in touch with Harrison through his agent and uh, they had lunch. They had, apparently, I wasn't there, but they had a really good lunch. Kelvin was the, the, uh, the, 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 the ambassador for 2000 AD. That sounds like a good job, I have to say. Uh, going to have yeah. lunch with science fiction writers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they had a rip roaring lunch, and Harry said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm happy for you to adapt my books into a comic strip." Um, and all we had to do then, as a company, was pay Harry's agent about a hundred pound for each strip, which I signed the check for. Kelvin went away and wrote them, and it was Carnuff, I think Carnuff really liked this. And as you say, uh, it was a huge, huge success. But we have to credit Kelvin for initiating that. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was yeah. him, him, him. And uh, again, you know, I, I, I would like to say that these people are still alive and they're worthy of a. Uh, similar recordings like this kelvin is extremely um uh, entertaining uh, as would be um uh john well maybe not john so much <laughs> <laughs> well, john if you're listening uh, i'm not making any assumptions on your part and all of these people are welcome i would love to talk to them all so yeah 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 exactly so okay so th that's my answer yeah Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was one of my um, favorite strips. Drew Gordon says, and I agree with him, he's surprised that these haven't been made into movies yet. Too bad they weren't done when Brad and Angelina were still together. They would have been great in the lead roles. They actually would have been a pretty good, uh, yeah. interesting yeah. casting yeah. choice there, I, yeah. I, I think. Um, yeah. Um, Strontium Dog um, had, a, had a whole backstory. Uh, here we go, which covered his idea as a, a, you know, his backstory as a kid. And by this time, we, we knew the character fairly well, having first met them in Star-Lord and everything. Again, this is one of my favourite stories. Um, very sort of, there's a whole vibe going back to World War II and Nazis and the superior Aryan white race and anyone who's different from that needs to be eliminated and a, a lot of that you can see you can see all that influence of history in in this storyline um and then the, you had the parliament building which was like this kind of floating fortress and they all attack it on jetpacks again very cinematic was all created recreated with lego in my bedroom and <laughs> probably didn't look half as good as it did on the comic but it was huge um, I had Lego people on jetpacks and all this kind of thing. Uh, y y this is why I remember these stories because I'd go on and try and sort of recreate all the action scenes in my my bedroom. You know, um, uh, this uh, Strontium Dog's one of your favourite characters. So, what would be your Strontium Dog um, favourite story? And did you ever were you ever tempted to sort of lean in any any creative suggestions? To that character to the writer and sort of team behind it or would you just wait for the next nice one to be presented to you 
Okay, so I think we need to clarify here. The artist is Carlos, who is Spanish, right? Yeah, yeah, Carlos. So he, yeah, King Carlos, thank you. Uh, now, Carlos, John yeah. Wagner um, and Alan Grant actually are basically full of Scottish. Yes, they are. They grew up in Scotland. They uh, may not have been born in Scotland, but they grew up there. So all the uh, characters in this strip that you're referring to have a very good Scottish uh, uh, bent to them. There's and, uh, McNulty oh, there with go. the kilt. Yeah. There you go. So we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that, uh, aside from your point about the Second World War, actually, this is more about Scotland <laughs> against England, perhaps. <laughs> Do you know, <laughs> I, I never it. really picked up on that, but now you yeah. say it, I can see it. Yeah. Yeah, there's something going. Yeah, the bad, the bad king down south. And anyway, maybe I'm extemporizing that too much, but we need to uh, we need to acknowledge the fact that uh, Wagner and Grant uh, uh, were very good at uh, adopting. Uh, well, with that, but with a, a tracking story, they could do very good uh, um, uh, tracker language. Anyway, coming mm -hmm. back to Strong Kim Dog, yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. What can I say? It's it's a great um, prequel to Wow, how he came to be, and uh, 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 what more can you say? I can't when, they just... when they came to you with this idea, you must have been like, "Yeah, that that sounds. You know, let's let's do that." How many issues is that? How many? Well, again, um, I really, you know, the, the notion of something coming to you with an idea may have been a short phone call. We're going to do his boyhood. And you go, what are you going to say? No, I don't want that. Are you going to say, yeah? Because you know, immediately you've got 30 episodes of your comic fixed so you can concentrate on the other the yeah. bits that are weaker. Yeah. So you're all, everything was a green light, whether it be Jerry, Pat, or John, it had to be. Alan. Because the rest of the comic was it was quite hard to find a writer until we thankfully found Alan Moore, who really then helped 2000 AD spread across uh, a wider consciousness, I would say, with Halo Jones. Who yep. ultimately sort of chose the covers? How did the process of what's going on the cover work? I mean, obviously it's planned weeks ahead, but but how did that work? That was me. I had so what, to choose the colour. Would you look at a strip and go, actually, if we enlarge this first frame, this is going to look great on the cover? Is that kind of how it well, went? Uh, yeah. uh, that, that, that's a bit too forensic. First of all, you'd say, OK, who hasn't been on the cover? Yep. You wanted to rotate them. But yeah. then you, you were told, actually, I was told by management, that Judge Dredd had to be on the cover every other week. Right. So That's then it. I was, so then I, I well, <laughs> so then you would look at the, as you say, you're quite right, you'd look at the, the other strips and say, what is the dynamic scene here? Well, take Harry 20, okay? Uh, there's a, there was a, a, a great cover where uh, the, uh, if you know Harry Twenty on the High Rock, the guy I do. It's exposed... one of my favourite stories of your era. Yeah. yeah, the guy exposes himself as a, a robot. Yeah, yeah, and that I knew that would make a great cover, but we had to do it after he'd done that. Otherwise, it would ruin the story. <laughs> if you yeah. see what I mean. So he did that in the previous episode, but we knew it would look great, perhaps to catch new readers, because right. you're always trying to hook. Someone looking who's not a 2000 reader, maybe they're buying Roy. Or, and, oh, why has that guy got a robot? I'll buy this comic. And then you know, wham, fingers crossed you got him. So you've got to keep getting the readers. Um, so yeah, it was me. Then I would say, I don't want to get too excited here, to my <laughs> dear art editor, Robin Smith, name check. Can you do an outline of how this might look? And he would read the script and then he would do a sketching, yeah? And we would send mm. that to the artist. And I think Robin has got a whole load of these coming out soon uh, in a book. 
and the artist would follow that. Right. So okay. Go. So basically, uh, prototype what the um, front page was going to be, pass it across, and then the artist was then run with it, and it would come back to yourself. Exactly. That what you have yeah. there. I remember. Uh, I remember me saying to Colin, "Well, come on, he's escaped. Let's do that." Not Colin, Robin. Robin did that sketch, and then Alan Davis drew that, and then we had it coloured. And where you go, there you go. Um, Harry Twenty, which is basically Escape from Alcatraz in space, um, combined with the final scene of The Spy Who Loved Me, when all the crews mm. break out and um, you know retake control of the Liparus and um, blow it up and escape in their submarine. Um, this is just an amazing story. I mean, again, I just I can't believe Rebellion haven't sat down and gone, okay, lots of people are making crap sequels and NAF sequels to existing IPs. What IPs have we got that we control that we can make either a great movie or a great miniseries or TV series, one season, maybe two seasons of? This one is begging to be made, absolutely begging to be made. It's got one of the best battle action sequences that climaxes the story ever i've read in a comic ever uh i just i, I just don't understand why they're sitting on all this stuff it's a gold mine gold mine um well, we have to credit here the writer curious in the yep. day yeah the artist alan davis now uh you know alan was only meant to draw half of it of the 20 episodes and he was meant to kind of alternate with a guy called alan what kiss r.i.p but Alan Watkins got another job. So I had to ring up Alan Davis and said, do you mind, but can you do the whole thing? And that meant Alan Davis drawing three pages a week for 20 weeks. And man, he, he, he nailed it. Yeah. yeah, it is impressive. It is impressive when you look at the end result of what's actually created in front of you, gone through the process, possible little tweaks on the side, but it's amazing stuff. Absolutely yeah. amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. and and again, credit to the writer. This this story really stuck in my head for a long time, and I, I think probably because the filmmaker in me was just thinking, well, this is going to be a movie at some point, and and we've had quite a few sci-fi prison movies. There were two that came out really close together. One was with um, the guy from Highlander, and then there was a another. Um, people in the chat will remind me of the titles. And I remember when I went to see them, I remember the first thing that, as soon as I sat down in the cinema, I was like, I wonder if this is going to be as good as Harry 20. And then as soon as I came out of the cinema, I went, well, that wasn't as good as Harry 20. When are we, we going to get a Harry 20 sci-fi prison hmm. um, movie or hmm. show? And, uh, I, you well, know, who, who knows? We're, getting the, we're getting the road trooper soon aren't we well funnily enough it's interesting that you should mention that because that's my next topic and i've got yep. the cub i've got the cover somewhere there it Just is i'll find it there it is now you co-created this character is that fair uh, no it said so on wikipedia so it must be true steve no <laughs> no no uh, i wish it was no uh, uh road trooper is co-created by jerry finley day and dave gibbon Okay. However, and this this is a big however. This is the biggest however in the history of co-creation. Uh, I think we have to go back to the Ten Commandments to, because uh, I do believe someone co-created the Ten Commandments. Right. Are you with me on this? Yes, um, absolutely. Okay. okay. So one road tripper. Uh, that's my title. I called it Road Trooper. Jerry had another title for it called Trooper Cube. Two, the biochips. That was my idea. Right. The rest is the creation of Jerry and uh, uh, Dave. Well, Dave always is not a part of that conversation. So, uh, but co created, no, because, uh, well, I'll leave that to uh, public. Um, I'll leave that to someone else to decide. Well, I mean, the biochips are fairly, that's a fairly key uh, idea. Uh, maybe it would be, you know, written by, but story by, your name should definitely be in there, I think, with the title and the chips 
Chip's thing is a key part of the story, it's fair to say. I don't mind, actually, because I don't suppose either Jerry or Dave got any money because they'd signed away their rights 50 years ago. And I don't suppose for Benny, they're going to hand them a million dollars. Um, and if they did, I'm sure Jerry would uh, pass me a little backhand uh, as a, a sign of goodwill. Uh, we'd, I, we'd all like to think that would be the case. So there's a there's a road trooper movie. Uh, I think it's fully animated. If I um, the information I've got is correct, uh, uh, do you know much about it? Have you seen anything? Have you been given any tidbits? No, no, no. Okay, well we'll move on then. Are you looking forward to <laughs> it? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean. Oh, it's a bit like an old partner, isn't it? Someone you love. Do yeah. you really want to see them again? I don't know. It's hard, that one. I always have this answer to those questions. Um, uh, I'm sure you do, You guys do too, don't you? Yeah. I, yeah. I've, I've listened. To, if um, The film that I tried to make for ages that never happened, although you can buy the script, so... Uh, I'm sure it's going to be made by somebody else uh, eventually because it's a public domain story and that would be a very, yeah. very difficult pill, you know, It's because um, yeah. it was my passion for, for so long. So I understand yeah. it 100%. It's got an incredible team of uh, voice artists uh, working on the production. You've got Jermaine Clement, Matt Berry, uh, both of kind of Flight of the Concords, what we do in the Shadows fame. Jack Loudon, who was in Dunkirk. Sean Bean needs no introduction, really. Hayley Atwell, Asa Butterfield, Butterfield, sorry, and um, Anurin Bernard, who was also in Dunkirk. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, uh, it'll, it'll be a, a faithful adaptation. And I think your boys are credited as writers on it as well. So yeah, they are. They must have had some level of creative uh, input on the story, surely. I guess we'll, we'll we'll wait and see. Okay, so sticking with the subject of of films, and I'm conscious of time, but I do do want to delve into this a little bit. Obviously, Judge Dredd really. I mean, it was already with the comic, but but certainly the stories were. It was a really rich era of Judge Dredd stories. Uh, while you were the, the captain of the many cogs in the machine. Um, and then we had the, we've had we had the Dread movie with Stallone, uh, which I was an extra in. Uh, well, that's a story, oh, that's yeah. a story for another time. Uh, and then um, we've had the Dread with Carl Urban. And Rebellion have been developing a Dread TV series. Um, I'm amazed it, it, it's taking as long as it is. Um, of the two movies, um, have, you, have you seen both the Stallone and the Carl Urban films? Okay. So as regards the first Red movie, I read the script. Um, right. Because we had to approve it as Fleetway. Um, it was our, it was Fleetway's copyright and the script came to me and I read it. And I wrote a long thing saying, oh, why is he taking his helmet off? Obviously that didn't. Yep. <laughs> They cut any ice, yeah. Um, so we then we went to several previews, uh, you know, where there's just a few invited people, um, on a Sunday afternoon, um, and uh, you, you know, the money is up there on the screen at that time. Uh, you can see they put money into the uh, mega city, but then after that, it goes down a bit. The first one. The second one, actually, you have to remember that actually 30 years, I, I wasn't really into, I left 2000 AD and comics per se in 1990. Yeah. So I wasn't really, I have seen uh, Carl Urban, and he is a, you know, a fabulous, but um, uh, I, I don't know much to say about that really. I, I'm more looking forward to the Road Trooper thing. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I know that where the Stallone dread was concerned, there were there were massive fingers in pies playing around with the edit. They cut so much out. They cut loads of violence out of it. 
Um, and there's some part of the action scenes at the end of the film don't even make any sense. Um, you know, so hey, it's, it's just just yeah, how it goes. yeah, yeah. Coming back to you on that, I, yeah, I, I had a phone call where uh, the uh, producer said he was going gang quote gangbusters to get a to come out of a, an X, whatever they call it in America. Yeah. R rating in the states. R, it was coming, going gamba. So therefore, that speaks to your thing about the violence. And then um, I, I know that uh, we went down to Shepparton to see it, a few of this, and uh, Danny, Danny, the uh, Cannon. director, Cannon, called mm. uh, John Wagner into his office and said, uh, "I'll give you ten thousand pounds to write some stuff to help this." bark out this movie and John said no quite rightly of course um, so that would so have been like were, moving deck chairs on the Titanic I think yeah. at that point yep. yeah and, and then um, uh, 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 one of the designers says it's famous now Chris so do you got to get Min Machine in here and, and they go Who, who is Min Machine and, well it's the Angel Gang you got to get them in and then so they didn't really know I mean, the American guy, he read all the s stories, but he didn't get it, the, uh, the script writer, you know. So it was a bit of a mishmash. Um, I think the second one was much more faithful, but you need money. You, you need money for that, that dress. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, when you look at the second one, um, and certainly my two pence worth with regards to Carl Urban, um, did a fantastic job of dread. Um, Oliver Thirlby, um or Thirlby, uh did a really good job with Anderson. Take Olivia, those, unless she's uh, changed. Olivia, six, sorry. Uh, Olivia, yeah. sorry. Um, did really good well uh really well with the characters. But again, it, you look at the the money aspect of it, and that's why they specifically targeted it just one building block. Keep it contained within one yeah. building block. Yeah. It contains the story, it doesn't go grandiose like some of the other um films are. Kind of like guilty of, and then that's where your money disappears to. Um, the CG very minimal in the grand scheme of things. So yeah, um, certainly out of the two, the latter one is certainly my my favourite of the dreads. But certainly there's aspects of both that I certainly enjoy. Yeah, I watched them both recently, and I think the first movie gets the look of Mega City One more more faithfully to the comics. The um, but the um, second film gets dread more, more yep. like dread in the comics. Um, and he you doesn't know, take his helmet, you know, that Batman uh cartoon series that it was really good, dark, um, recently, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's how they should have done or could still do dread. It's uh, they could still do it, younger, or, younger audience, um. You know, dynamic music, uh, quite dark. You know, mm. he's still not quite a, a heavy guy, but <laughs> I think that would really go down well amongst today's anxious. I think there's a lot of anxiety um, amongst young children today. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. This, well, yeah, that's you know. So it would really work well. Guy, yeah, yeah, to some guy who's practically you know, can can uh, at least. Oh, well, I'm, I'm palavering a bit, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, touch stone. That's the word. Steve, I want to plug your existing projects before we wrap right. up. Um, okay. And one of these is, is despite you saying I left comics in 1990, <laughs> um, you decided to get involved in this, and you're wearing the T-shirt and everything. Um, uh, you can't see that because my name oh, there is. No, we can see it. We can see it. Okay. You can um, and this, this is okay. a project on Kickstarter. And by the way, guys, the, the link is there. You can find out more about it. I think people can still put money into it, I think. Um, uh, but you can or, certainly buy the issues. Buy. Yeah. Just tell us quickly how this came about. And, I mean, were you a glutton for punishment and decided to dive back in? Was retirement a bit boring? What what What, what happened? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so retirement was boring. This is a love letter to the comics we've been speaking about, the ones that were sold in the 70s. Uh, so um, uh, it came about through me writing a, 
uh, a comedic novel about my about how comics were then and uh, a guy called Ben Cullis rang me up and he said we could turn this into a comic I'll get the writers the artists his company is called the 77 you may have heard of it yeah I'm um, on the I'm on the Facebook group there you go so this is issue four it's coming out soon uh we, we raised enough that each issue is kick-started so um shows there is a, a passion for it i'm loving it i write the letters page this is my favorite bit <laughs> people write in and uh, I, um it's just great if you if you were a man of a uh, woman of 50 years old and you remember comics of your youth blazer it's a one for you you can find out more about it here so it's a, it's a throwback um to the old school uh, comics of the late 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Uh, so we're talking battle, early early Judge Dredd, action, uh, Valiant, that kind of thing. Um, great artwork. Uh, and then you've also got a biography out. Here it is called The Mighty One, My Life Inside the Nerve Center. And is this just about your time at 2000 AD or does it cover your career as a whole? My career as a whole. But I think it might be out of print now. You can get secondhand copies on Amazon. It's a great read. John Wagner said it was essential. Um, well, it is also available on Kindle, and there are there's not loads, but there are a few copies available on um, Amazon, uh, secondhand ones. Uh, so get them now before they go. Otherwise, you might have to pay a fortune for one on um, eBay later on. Good point. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, fantastic. Tomby, have you got any other questions before we wrap up? No, I think I think it's been an absolute pleasure to meet Steve. Thank you very much indeed for your insight, certainly into the editing side of life and the comics. Um, I'm I'm absolutely amazed at some of the things that you've been able to create over the years of of a career that spanned decades, decades. So, thank you very much indeed for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure, sir. It's an interesting. Thanks comment from drew gordon which is maybe a good one to end on if dread was japanese there'd be 10 animated series and four live action movies including a reboot by now and i think he's probably um not wrong uh so uh, uh keith i read the super chat out earlier mate thanks very much for pointing out but i did get to that i did cover it yep. earlier so uh just remains for me to say thanks very much uh to all the people uh in the chat with your comments and i've got a lot of new people uh, uh that have come into the stream today uh, i've been running this channel uh, in its current form uh since july of uh 2022 it was a bit like 2000 ad and tornado i absorbed the older version of the channel uh, into yeah. its current form uh this is industry interview number 54 uh we had uh ron underwood who was the director of tremors on last week and producer Gail Ann Hurd of Aliens, Terminator and Terminator 2 came on that stream as a surprise guest. So you wow. might want to check that out. Uh, and I've got more stuff like this in the future. And there may be other people from 2000 AD uh, coming on as well, because uh, Steve's going to put them in touch with me. And if yes. they're willing to come on uh, and uh, chat about their various uh, strips they've written and stuff or artwork they've done, I would love to talk to them. Uh, th these 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 interviews are valuable from a point of view of if we don't have these conversations now uh, in a public domain, I kind of feel like they're they're lost forever. And um, what's also nice about it, Steve, is it gives a, a chance uh, for for want of a better word, I suppose, super fans of this era like myself and Tommy to directly thank you and also yep. articulate the kind of influence that you had on us culturally with me building you know dan dare ships out of lego and mega city one and <laughs> recreating the stories and taking them further in my bedroom and fueling my own imagination that would then pass on in scripts and things that i would write later in my life so um the influence that this era of 2000 ad had on my life is is huge it's it, i can't even quantify it so um on Agreed. behalf of myself and my guest to all of the people that worked under you 
and your team during that time. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. It, it was honestly, you made a fantastic contribution to our lives and, and one that we'll never forget. And I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of all the people in the chat as well who are familiar with this era. So on that note, thanks very much to my co-host, Tombi, and of course my guest, uh, Steve McManus. Do please support his other work. Do check out Blazer. The link is below in the information below in this stream. The link is also below for his uh, biography. Grab it while it's still um, available. And uh, we're going to be back on, I think I'm doing a stream about Shogun, the original Shogun, before the new one drops on Friday tomorrow. I was originally going to do that later tonight, but I knew I'd be too tired, so I moved it. Um, so I'll be talking about the Richard Chamberlain Shogun, the TV series that kick-started all the mini-series. It was the first one. Um, the link for Blazers issues one to three is in the chat. Well done, Tom's. Thanks very much. Thank and I'll be back on Sunday talking about Masters of the Air, episode six. Until then, uh, that's it from me. Uh, we'll speak to you again real soon. <laughs>